<clears throat> All right, good morning, everyone. Size of the group keeps getting smaller and smaller. Okay, so great. So uh, just a couple announcements to kind of start off with. Uh, first things first is I finally posted all the practice problems on Pearson. Uh, I meant to do that like a week ago, but I kept forgetting. My babysitter has not been keeping an eye on me. Or that's your job. You were my babysitter last semester. So you gotta be it again. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, second thing is the conceptual questions for today are now already posted. They're available on Pearson. They're due tomorrow at five o'clock. And exam two is a week and a half basically from today. So it's not this Friday, but next Friday. So it's almost time for that guy already. So I'll post all the practice stuff for that this afternoon. Uh, so I'll put up with the old exam questions and all that good stuff so you can start working on all those things. So basically today we'll finish up most of the way through this chapter. So we've already gone through chapter 22. We'll finish up this chapter definitely by tomorrow, chapter 23. So tomorrow we'll do a couple more group assignments. Um, and then from there, so that means Friday we'll start chapter 24, which is what's known as Gauss's Law. I'll talk more about that as we get there. And then next week we'll spend that talking about the last chapter, which is chapter 25. So we'll start talking about all that potential stuff that you guys did in lab uh, this past week. So. so let me just kind of remind you where we were and what we did. So last time we were working on the electric field of a disk of radius r uh, with charge q and we found was that the electric field only points in the vertical direction which we called the z direction. So here we're just calling that this is okay, the x direction, the y direction, and then this is the z direction. <clears throat> and what we found was that the electric field was equal to 2 pi times k, where again, k is the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. That's the 9 times 10 to the 9th. Times eta, where again, eta is the charge density. So that's the charge per unit area. Times 1 minus z divided by the square root of z squared plus r squared, all pointing in the k hat direction. Now, what we finished off talking about last time is anytime I get an electric field and I want to make sure that it's correct, I should check my limiting cases. So again, as we talked about before, the limiting cases are one of two of them. If I get far enough away from the object, meaning if I go infinitely far away in the z direction here, my object better look like a point charge. If it doesn't look like a point charge, I automatically know I'm wrong. Okay? That's what this one says. So as I go infinitely far away, this thing better reduce down to a point charge, which means this thing should become kq divided by z squared in this case, because I'm only going in the z direction, and the k hat direction. But if I go infinitely close to it, so if I go in this direction, meaning if z goes to zero or simultaneously r goes to infinity, if I take the radius of this disk and I blow it up to infinity, this thing better look like a sheet of charge. And it better look like a plane. If it doesn't look like a plane, which the electric field of the plane is epsilon, or sorry, eta divided by two epsilon naught, then again, something went wrong. So these are good ways to check if something went wrong or not. Now this is not only true in this case, this is true in any case. So any object that I look at, if I get infinitely far away from it, it better look like a point charge. If I get infinitely close to it, it better look like a sheet of charge. So these are two ways I can check. And just to kind of show you, let's check this guy. So let's look at the first limiting case. So let's check this and let's look at case number one. Let's let Z go to infinity. So, <clears throat> We have EP then is equal to 2 pi k eta times 1 minus z divided by the square root of r squared plus z squared, all in the k hat direction. Since z is going to go to infinity, if I simply take z going to infinity here, what that means then is what? I'm going to get an infinity on the top divided by an infinity on the bottom, but an infinity on the top divided by an infinity on the bottom is the same thing as 1. So I'm going to get a 1 minus 1, which is 0. That's not a point charge. So in this case, I can't simply just say, let z go to infinity, but I'm gonna have to do a little bit of massaging. And the massaging we're gonna have to do in this case is do a Taylor series expansion. So let's make this thing look beautiful. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna factor out a z squared from the bottom. So I'm gonna pull out a z squared from here. So this is gonna become r squared divided by z squared. I'm gonna get a z here, so those two z's are gonna cancel. So this thing is gonna become two pi k eta 1 minus the square root of 1 plus r divided by z quantity squared, 1 on top. 
Now, in this case, when z goes to infinity, I have a finite number divided by something that's going to infinity, so this thing is going to be something very small. So here, I'm going to call r divided by z simply x, where x is going to be much, much less than 1. So that means this thing is going to become 2 pi k eta, 1 minus 1 divided by the square root of 1 plus x squared in the k hat direction. So now what we want to do is Taylor series this about x, which is very, very small. So x is going to be approximately equal to 0 or much, much less than 1. Now, anybody remember what the Taylor series expansion is of a square root? Not so much. So remember your Taylor series expansion say that if I have 1 plus x all raised to the nth power, then this is approximately then equal to 1 plus x divided by n, I'm sorry, n times x, sorry about that, plus blah, blah, blah. In our case, we're dealing with x squared, so this is also true with x squared, so I might as well call that an x squared. So for us, what we have is a square root, let me write it this way, 1 plus x squared raised to the minus 1 half power, which means for our case, n is simply equal to negative a half. So that means this is approximately then equal to 1 minus x squared divided by 2. So this is our Taylor series expansion. So if I plug this in here, then EP then becomes 2 pi times k times eta times 1 minus 1 minus x squared divided by 2 in the k hat direction. How many of you are in Cal 2 now? So you haven't gotten to Taylor series. Great. That's fine. Anybody else in Cal 2? Derek 2? So the rest of you have taken Cal 2? So this is bringing back nightmares? Right. Okay, so what's going to happen here? So this one is going to cancel out this one. This is going to make this guy positive. So this thing is going to become 2 pi times k times eta times x squared all divided by 2 in the k hat direction. <coughs> so good. So here the 2s are going to cancel. Great. So this is going to become, so remember, first of all, that eta is equal to the total charge divided by the total area which in our case, the total area is simply equal to pi capital R squared. So let's do this in small steps. So this is going to become pi times k, but k, remember, is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times eta, which is now q divided by pi r squared times x squared, where remember x is equal to r divided by z squared in the k hat direction. Okay. I've moved up for you, but I can't. I don't have that. <laughs> What's up, Dylan? My denominator is 4 times pi times epsilon naught, which I could have left as k now that I kind of think about it. But this is pi r squared z squared. It really looks better like a z. Now, let's cancel some stuff out. Let's use blue now. This pi is going to cancel this pi. This r squared is going to cancel this r squared. So this thing then becomes q times k divided by z squared, all in the k hat direction. Is that a point charge? Yes. Limiting case number one, it works. Life is good. As it should. Are you okay? Well, at least I didn't, but okay. Everyone else, okay. Let's look at limiting case number two. Limiting case number two says that now we're either going to take z goes to zero or r goes to infinity. Either one of these two are the same thing. So let's do that. So now we have EP is equal to 2 pi times k times eta times 1 minus z divided by r squared plus z squared, square rooted all in a k-hat direction, right? Well, what happens now? So if I let r here now go to infinity, the denominator then goes to infinity, which means a finite z divided by infinity is equal to 1. With anything divided by infinity? Zero, right? 
So this term simply goes to zero. This one's a nice easy one. We don't have to do a Taylor series expansion. So this thing now is simply equal to two pi k times eta in the k hat direction. But again, this is two pi times k, but k again is four pi divided by epsilon naught times eta in the k hat direction. So here, the two is gonna cancel with this one. This pi is gonna cancel. So this becomes eta divided by two epsilon naught in the k hat direction. Is this a sheet of charge? Yes. In any case, number two works. So if I check my two limits, the point of all this again is if I check my limits, if I take the time and check the limits to be careful, I can always make sure that the electric field that I found is correct based off of these limits. So again, if I go infinitely far away, it better look like a point charge. If I go infinitely close to it, it better look like a sheet of charge. If neither one of these two limits work, or if one of them works but the other one doesn't, again, it means I went wrong somewhere. Somewhere in my math, I made a snafu, and something is now wrong. Okay. Okay. Got Typically, yes. Yeah, because one may be true and the other one is wrong. So it's always better to check both as opposed to just one of them. Because it could be that I have done it such that if I go infinitely far away, it looks like a point charge. But if I go infinitely close to it, I get something that's not a sheet of charge. Or vice versa. Just depends on where my math was actually wrong. So. Is it okay? Now, another place that this works very well when you guys actually do differential equations in the future, a lot of times we don't need to solve the differential equation. All we have to do is simply guess. If we guess and we have the right solution, by default, that is the correct solution. So if we guess and it has the correct limits, that is the solution. So just remember that when you get to differential equations, you start playing with things like this. A lot of times we simply guess at what the solution happens to be. So good. So let's do one more example. So next example says, what is the electric field at distance R above the center of a thin rod of length L and charge Q? So let's look at this guy. So here's my rod. So let's draw my rod. Good. So we're told is that this thing has a length of L to it. <laughs> and we want to know the halfway point, some distance above the halfway point, which we're calling a distance R, we want to know what is the value of the electric field at this point. So this is our point P. So again, we want to know what is the value of the electric field at point P. Now Derek asked a good question after class last time. He said, how do I know if something has line symmetry? So here, even though I'm drawing this rod as something thick, but this thing technically has line symmetry to it because, as I told Derek, I didn't tell you the extent of the rod. All I told you is that you had a thin rod, which was a length of L, but I didn't tell you the thickness of the rod. Just like with the ring, I told you it was a ring which was bent, but I didn't tell you how thick that ring was. So you had one radius, not two radii, okay? So in this case, even though I'm drawing this thing thick for visual purposes, this thing is simply just a straight line, which means it has one dimensional symmetry to it. So this thing has simply line symmetry. So this thing's gonna have line symmetry. Which means then that dq is simply gonna be equal to lambda dl. So this is gonna be our dq. So this thing has line symmetry, this is gonna be lambda dl. So remember, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna choose some location to cut dl or dq. So this is gonna be my dq. So this is dq, which again is gonna be equal to lambda dl, where the thickness of this is dl. R then, again, is going to be the distance from point P to dq, so this is my distance r. So let's define, let's put in a coordinate system. So let me say, this is the origin of my coordinate system. Let's call this the x direction. Let's again call this the z direction, just for fun. So that this distance here, we're gonna call simply the distance x. So x then is gonna be the distance from the origin to the location of that dq, which has a thickness of dl. Since I'm calling this the x direction, that means this thickness here of dl is simply equal to that of dx. So that means dl is actually the same thing as dx. R by Pythagorean theorem then is going to be what? X squared plus R squared, square rooted. So R, write that down. So R squared then is going to be equal to capital R squared 
plus x squared. Now again, as we also talked about last time, what we want to do is look for symmetry. Does this thing have a symmetry, meaning is any portion of the electric field going to cancel? And the answer to that is yes, because if I cut another dq here, so this is a symmetric dq on this side, that means from this one, this electric field contribution is going to point this way. So it's going to be dE. From this side, it's going to point in this direction. So this is going to be dE, which means that what? What's going to happen to two horizontal pieces? Cancel like before. So that the total electric field is simply going to point in the z direction. Now notice that is only true when I'm at the center point of the rod. If I was not at the center point of the rod, this is no longer true. For example, if I chose this point as my point P instead, let's call that P prime, what happens in this case? Well, in this case, if I use that same DQ, in this case, my electric field would point off in this direction, but there's nothing on this side which is going to cancel that. Which means if I'm not looking at the center point of the rod, if I'm looking any other place, what has to be true by my electric field? It has to be two dimensional. Which means if that's true, how many integrals do I have to do? Two integrals. I'm going to have to do one integral for each different direction. Then I'm going to have to find a y component, or in this case, a z component and an x component, which both cases are going to take an integral to do that. Okay? So in this case, we're doing the simplest case, which is directly in the center, to get rid of that extra x component to make it only in the z direction. Was okay? Good, so let's put everything together. So now we know that this is equal to k times the integral of dq divided by r squared. But again, we need something which tells me it only points in the z direction. So I'm going to go ahead and again define this angle here, theta, which means I need to multiply this by cosine of theta. And this is all going to be in the k hat direction. Again, only the vertical piece, so I need the cosine of that angle. Now, like before, cosine of that angle is then equal to the adjacent side, which in this case, the adjacent side is capital R. So this is going to be capital R divided by little r. Okay. So adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. So this guy is going to become equal to k times lambda times the integral of dx divided by r squared plus x squared to the three halves times r all in the k hat direction. Everything's okay? So I get r squared plus x squared from the r squared, but then from the cosine term, I get an extra square root of that. So that's why that's a three halves. And that capital R comes from the cosine term as well. Now capital R is constant. So this thing is gonna become equal to k times r times lambda times the integral of dx divided by r squared plus x squared all raised to the three halves in the k hat direction. Now here again, I need my bounds of integration. So according to my picture, since this thing has a length of L, this distance from here to the end of the rod is L over two. This distance from here is negative L over two. So my bounds of integration are then gonna be minus L over two to L over two. So I'm integrating from negative half the length of the rod to the other half of the length of the rod. Because that's how I define my coordinates. Take it from the center. That was okay. Now, to solve this, you would have to use a trig sub. I am prepared to do a trig sub for you guys, but we're kind of running out of time for next week's exam. So I'm just going to say, in this case, we would pretend we're on the exam. We'd skip to the first page of the exam. We would look up this integral, and what we find is the value of this integral then is equal to k times r times lambda times x divided by r squared, square root of r squared plus x squared, evaluated from minus l over two, to, here we go, to l over two, all in the k hat direction. Good, from here when I'm going to evaluate this at x then is equal to l over two, subtract that from l equals negative two, Plug all that in, and what we finally get then is that the electric field at point P then is equal to lambda times R divided by 
2 pi times epsilon naught times L over 2 times R squared times the square root of L squared over 4 plus R squared in the k hat direction. Or in this case, lambda is equal to Q divided by L. So that L is going to cancel out that L. And I can finally write this then as Q divided by 2 pi epsilon naught R. So this R is going to cancel out with one of these times one over the square root of four times r squared plus l squared in the k hat direction. So this is by electric field at point P. Okay. Now again, as far as the exam is concerned, the part you are responsible for is setting up this integral, which means you would have to get it to this form using the definitions of all these things. Once you get it here, you would simply switch to the first page of the integral, look up the value of the integral, jump to this stage, finish plugging in your stuff, and then reduce it as much as possible. What's up, Dylan? I'm sorry? This one? Well, after you plug in your bounds, then you would get your final answer. So basically, if you got it to you know, this stage from here after plugging in your bounds, I'd, pretty, I'd be pretty happy. I'd want you to go to that step, but again, that takes a little more out of so. I like it. But if you got it to the red one, I'd be, I'd be happy. Everyone's okay? Sure. I'm sorry? Uh, can you go back to the last sure. Oh, because I set up my coordinate system to make the z-axis along the point, then I mean, since this has a length of L, then this is L over two and this is also L over two. So half the rod is on this side and half the rod is on this side. But since I have positive x going in this direction, then I'm integrating from a negative L over two to then finally an L over two. If I chose the other point P instead, in that case, I would choose this as my Y axis, this as my X axis. So in that case, my bounds of integration would be from zero to L in that case. So it just depends on how I'm choosing my coordinates. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So no more integrations. Right? So good. So the next thing we want to talk about is, so, so far we've seen the electric field is defined as the force per unit charge. But not only is this a way to tell me how to define the electric field, but what this also tells me is that the force on a charged particle is equal to the charge times the electric field. So what does this mean? So what this means is if an electric field exists at any point in space, if I put the charge at that point in space, I automatically know the force on that charge, automatically. So not only can I determine the electric field from the force, but I can determine the force from the electric field. It works both ways. So ultimately what this thing tells me then is that the electric field is actually more fundamental than force. Because the force does not exist unless the electric field exists. So if there is no electric field, there is no force. So I have to have the one before I can have the other one. Even though I define the other from the first, but the other way has to exist first. Okay. If you understand what that means. So what that means is I have to have an electric field first to have a force. So the electric field is actually more fundamental. Once I know what the electric field is, if I drop a point charge at any point within that space, I automatically know what the force is by default. So let's do some examples of this. So the first example we're going to look at is we're going to take a charged particle, a charge Q, moving, say, in this direction with an initial velocity of V, and we're going to send that in through parallel plate capacitors. So two charged plates, <coughs> where this one has a surface charge density of eta, this one has minus the surface charge density of eta, <coughs> which means that this one is positively charged, this one then is negatively charged. So for now, let's say that Q is positive. So what's going to happen to this charged particle as it moves between the plates? Well, what we know is that there's an electric field. That electric field exists between the plates, which points from the positive plate to the negative plate. 
This is my electric field. We talked about before that the electric field magnitude here is simply equal to the charge density divided by epsilon naught. So what's going to happen? Well, what happened is that charge particle is going to move through the plates. It's going to get here. But as it gets to this location, it's now going to experience a force from the electric field, which means that this thing is going to feel a force downward. So this one is going to experience a force in the direction of the electric field because it's a positive charge particle. Now, no, if this was a negative charge particle, the force then would be in the opposite direction because, again, going back to here, if the electric field points to the right, the charge is negative. And remember, a negative sign means I have to rotate by 180 degrees, so the force would be in the opposite direction if this guy was negative. So if the charge is positive, the direction of the force is in the same direction as the electric field. If the charge is negative, then the force is in the opposite direction. So what will happen is this guy's going to be moving with constant velocity v through here, but there's now going to be a force perpendicular to its motion, which means what's going to happen to the particle? It's going to deflect. This thing's going to feel a constant force downward everywhere in between the planes. So it's actually going to do something like this. So this charged particle, as it moves through, will actually experience a path that looks like this. Once it gets outside of the plates, it will start moving in a straight line again. So what we want to know then is by how much is this particle deflected? So how much, if I call this the y direction, what is the deflection of the particle while it is inside of these charge plates? So <clears throat> let's call this direction the x direction, this is the direction the y direction, so that this thing is deflected into y. So I want to know how much is this thing deflected? Good. <clears throat> so what do we know? As the particle is moving in this direction, in the x direction, is there any force in the x direction? Meaning, is there any like air resistance or any other electric fields happen to be in the x direction putting on a force onto it? Did Matthew come up and kick it in the face for some reason? No, right? He may want to, but he didn't. So in this case, the answer is no, there is no force in the x direction, which means what has to be true about the velocity in the x direction? It has to be constant, right? So first thing we know from here is that the acceleration in the x is equal to zero, which means the velocity in the x is simply equal to the initial velocity. So there is no deflection in the x direction. It's going to feel no force in the x direction. The acceleration in the y direction, what's that equal to? Well, we now know that there's a force in the y direction, so we can say the sum of the forces in the y are equal to q times the electric field. Force is then going to be simply equal to mass times the acceleration. This is the y acceleration is then equal to q times the electric field, which is then eta divided by epsilon naught. So the acceleration in the y direction is simply equal to the charge of the charge particle times the charge density of the plates divided by the mass times epsilon naught. So this is the acceleration that this thing feels in the x direction, or sorry, in the y direction. What's up there? Why is it not twice of that? Uh, because remember that the electric field from a single plate is epsilon over, or eta over two epsilon naught. So I already took away that two because there are two plates there. Exactly. Is okay? Cool. So this says then that's what? The deflection in the y direction is then going to be equal to our kinematic equation. So it's going to be the initial velocity in the y times the time plus one half the acceleration in the y times t squared. Now, what was the initial velocity in the y direction? Zero, it wasn't moving in the y direction. So I know this term is simply equal to zero. So this is going to be equal to one half the acceleration in the y times the time squared, which is then equal to one half the charge of the charge particle times the charge density divided by the mass times epsilon naught times the time squared. So this says that I can determine <coughs> the deflection it has between the planes if I know the amount of time it spends between the planes. How do I know the amount of time it spends between the planes? Well, if the length of the plates is simply equal to L, 
and we know that the velocity in the x direction is equal to a constant, how would we find the time? Well, the time would simply be what? The length of the plates divided by the velocity. So here, we then know that the time is then equal to the length divided by the velocity. So this thing is going to be equal to 1 half q eta divided by m epsilon naught times nl squared divided by v0 squared. So this is the deflection of this particle while it is between the planes. Okay, let's do it. So the next one says, so that was problem. We'll do that one next. Scary harmonic oscillation, yeah. We'll do that at the end. So this one says, in the figure below, we have a uniform electric field. That's this electric field is pointing upward and has a constant magnitude of two times ten to the third newtons per coulomb between these little plates, so that this is the positive plate, this is the negative plate, so again, the electric field points upward. The length of the plates is 10 centimeters. The separation between the two plates is 2 centimeters. We're then going to shoot an electron here so that it just skims the bottom plate, coming in with an initial velocity, v0, where v0 is 6 times 10 to the 6th meters per second, and this angle here is 45 degrees. So the first thing we want to know is, will this electron strike one of these two plates? So meaning, so again, let's think about it. So if it's an electron that has a negative charge, so if the electric field is this way, since a negative charge means the force has to be the opposite direction as the electric field, which means the force is going to be downward in this direction, so the charged particle is going to do something like this. It's going to curve downward. So what this wants to know, is this thing going to strike one of the two plates? So meaning, is this thing going to curve, but the electric field might not be great enough, so the force is not going to be great enough, so it might hit the top plates? Or, is the electric field so great that this thing is going to curve, but it's going to curve too much and hit the bottom plate here? What we want to know is, which one is this going to happen? Is it going to strike one of these two plates? Then, if we determine if it hits, say, the top plate or the bottom plates, where is it going to hit the plates? So how far from the left end will it hit the plates? So again, if this thing curves, but doesn't curve enough, it hits here, we want to know this distance. And if it curves too much and it hits here, we want to know this distance. So how far from the left end is this electron going to hit? Whichever plate is going to hit. Doing okay? Similar to the last problem we just did, except now there's X components and Y components and all kinds of different fun stuff. Everyone's okay? <clears throat> cool. So now, let's ask a question. How would I know if the thing hit the top plate? So what would have to be true if they hit the top plate? So meaning, if we have this electric field, and I pretend the top plate wasn't there, this thing starts to curve. <clears throat> if it hit the top plate, what would have to be true about the maximum distance it would make it away from the bottom plate? So meaning, if I took away the top plate, said there was this electric field, I'm going to do this, right? So it's going to reach some maximum height. If it hit the top plate, what would have to be true about that maximum height versus the height of the plate? It would have to be greater, right? So, <clears throat> the first thing we should look at then is what is the maximum height at which this charge particle is going to make it? If the height of that maximum height is greater than the separation distance between these two plates, well, it has to hit the top plate. If that separation distance or the maximum height is less than the separation distance, then it's going to miss the top plate. And then we'll talk about how to deal with the rest of it from there. So let's look at that first. So the first thing we should look at is what is y max? What's the maximum height at which this thing is going to hit? So again, let's draw a picture. So here is my electron. This thing has charge of little e. It's in an electric field, which is pointing this way. And it's going to feel a force on this guy down in this direction because the force is opposite the electric field because it's a negative charge. 
in this case, we know the velocity is pointing this way. So this is V zero. And uh, this angle here is theta, which is equal to 45 degrees. So what do we want to know? So again, we want to know what is y. So let's talk about y. So y then is equal to v initial in the y direction times time minus one half the acceleration times y times t squared. So what is a y? So again, we'd say the sum of the forces in the y direction are equal to the mass times the acceleration. And then here we have the only force acting on it is the electric force. So we have little e times e is equal to may, which means a y then is equal to e e over time. So this is the acceleration that this thing is going to feel. So this thing is going to become then the initial velocity in the y. So that's v initial times sine of 45 degrees times the time minus one half e e over m times the time squared. Now what I want to know is what's the maximum height that y is going to make it? So what is y max? How am I going to get y max? So this is just y. This is any height at which this thing is from t is equal to zero, which is at zero height. So how do I know, or where is t max going to come from? Because I have y max, I have to have t max, so where am I going to get t max from? Where's t max going to come from? What has to be true about the particle when it reaches maximum height? Velocity equals zero. Velocity equals zero, great. Let me find something to throw. I have hand sanitizer. Let's throw some hand sanitizer. So exactly here, if I throw this thing into the air, what has to be true is that the y portion of the velocity has to be zero. Actually, it didn't land on the top. There's no hand sanitizer. It's kind of sad. But anyways, so what has to be true is that the y portion of the velocity has to be equal to zero at maximum height. This is where we're going to get t max from. So to get t max, we know that the y portion of the velocity has to be equal to zero. <clears throat> when this thing is at max height. So this is gonna be equal to the initial velocity, so that's y, v zero times sine of 45 degrees, minus the acceleration, e e, divided by m, times the time, t max. Let's solve this now for t max. So this says then that t max is then equal to the mass times the initial velocity, times sine of 45, divided by e. <clears throat> from this maximum time, we can now plug this into that expression for y to then solve for the maximum height that this thing is going to make it. Is okay? So let's do that. Switch page. So we now get y max then is equal to v0 sine of 45 times the time, but the time then is going to be equal to v0 sine of 45 divided by times m divided by e times e minus one half v zero. Oops, not v zero. So this is e times e divided by m times v zero sine of 45 times m divided by e e squared. Sounds okay? Now, let's write this out a little bit further. So this is going to be equal to the mass times the initial velocity squared times sine squared of 45 divided by e e minus one half of. So what's going to happen here is this e is going to become squared. So there's an e here, which is going to cancel those two. So this is just going to be e e. This mass here is going to become squared, but there's a mass here, so it's going to cancel that. So this is thing is going to be equal to the mass times the initial velocity squared times sine squared of 45 divided by e. So how does this term here compare to this term here? They're the same, except this one is half the size of this one. So this is the same thing as x minus half of x, but what's x minus half of x? Half of x, right? So y max then is gonna be simply equal to one half of the mass times the initial velocity squared times sine squared of 45 divided by e times e. Plugging my numbers, what I find in this case then is the distance this thing makes it is about 2.56 
So the maximum height that this thing makes it is 2.56 centimeters. So as we said, if this thing is going to, we now want to compare this number now to the maximum height or the separation distance between the plates. According to our problem, the separation distance between the plates is two centimeters. So is 2.56 centimeters greater or smaller than two centimeters? It's greater. So if 2.56 centimeters is greater than two centimeters, what does that mean that it has to hit? It has to hit the top plate. So the answer to part A is that it hits the top plate. You know, this thing hit the top plate. So if we drew our picture, what we now know is that our electron, which starts off here, going this direction with the initial at 45 degrees, is going to curve, but not enough, so it's going to strike the plate. What we now want to know for part B is, what's that distance? What is the distance from the end that this thing is going to hit? So, how would we do that? Well, again, we would use a kinematic equation. So for part B, we would say X then is equal to the initial velocity in the X direction times the time plus one half the acceleration times the time squared. But what's the acceleration in the X direction? Zero, so we're gonna ignore it. So this says that we can determine the distance X by simply knowing the time. If I know the time it takes for this thing to go up to this maximum height here, or the separation distance of D, so this distance here is the separation distance D, <clears throat> then I can determine the distance at which it's going to hit. So how am I going to find that time? Where is that time going to come from? Go ahead, Derek. Exactly. So all we're going to do is go back to our original y expression, this guy. But here, instead of solving for max height, we're going to simply say y has to be equal to d. Once we have y is equal to d, we can solve for the time using a quadratic expression, use that time back into our other expression to then find the distance of x. Exactly. So, good. so to find the time, we're simply going to say, well, d then is equal to V initial sine of 45 degrees times T minus one half E times E over M times the time squared. Solve this, we would take this term, add it to the other side, so this becomes one half E E over M times T squared minus the initial velocity sine of 45 degrees times T plus D is equal to zero. From here, we solve simply a quadratic expression. Right? This is our A term, this is our B term, this is our C term. Find that time, plug that into here. So finally, what we find is that this is equal to the initial times cosine of 45 degrees times this time here. Look at the numbers, what we find is that this thing works out to be about 2.72 centimeters. So the distance from the left end that it hits is 2.72 centimeters long. Okay. Not too bad. One more. Let's do one more. So the next one says. We have an electron which is constrained to move along the center axis of a charged ring of radius r within a distance of z much, much less than the radius of r. So it's going to oscillate up and down very small compared to that radius. And it wants us to show that the electron can cause it to oscillate in harmonic oscillation with an angular frequency of the square roots of the charge of the electron times the charge of the ring times k divided by the mass times r squared. And this is what it wants us to show. So basically what will happen is, well, so let's draw our picture. So here's my ring. 
This is my Z axis again. And then here we're going to put a charged electron. So here's going to be my electron. <clears throat> so what will happen? So if the ring is positively charged, what will happen then is that when I displace it away from the center point, I'm going to get an attractive force between the electron here and the charged ring, which means if it is displaced above the ring, this thing is going to feel a force pulling it down towards the center of the ring. But as it gets in the center of the ring, as we'll see, what actually happens to the electric field is the electric field goes to zero at the absolute center of the ring, which means that the force is zero, which means by the time it gets to the center of the ring, it has maximum velocity with zero acceleration. So it's going to go pass through the center. And then as it goes out through the other side, it's going to feel a force again back towards the center of the ring because the force is now going to be pulling it back towards the center, which means this thing is going to go harmonic oscillations. So this thing is going to harmonically oscillate back and forth between Z and minus Z. So what we want to know is, what is the angular frequency of this harmonic oscillation? So good. So to do that, same thing as before, just like we did a harmonic oscillation, we're going to write out the sum of the forces. We're going to isolate the acceleration. From the acceleration, we then get the angular frequency. So let's do that. So we can say the sum of the forces in the z direction is then equal to the mass times the acceleration. The only force acting on this here then is from the charge ring. So this is going to be the charge of the electron times the electric field of the ring must then be equal to the mass times the acceleration. <clears throat> this then says that the acceleration then is equal to, technically this is negative, put it in negative, minus E times E ring divided by the mass. Now from here, we would go back in our notes and we would then determine what is the electric field of a ring. So just to remind you, what we found was that the electric field of a ring is equal to K times Q times Z divided by Z squared plus R squared all to the three halves power. This was the magnitude of the electric field. So again, what this thing says is when Z goes to zero, this term goes to zero, which forces the electric field to go to zero, which means the force has to go to zero at the origin. So let's plug that in here. So this becomes minus K times Q times E times Z divided by Z squared plus R squared to the three halves times the mass is all equal to the acceleration. Now this is almost harmonic oscillation because remember harmonic oscillation, this thing has to be proportional to Z, but I have this extra Z squared here. But the problem clarified that we want Z much, much less than R. Now we talked about this before. If Z is much, much less than R, then that means Z squared is much, 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 much less than R squared, which means Z squared plus R squared is the same thing as simply R squared. So this is R squared raised to the three halves, which is simply R cubed. So this is then going to be minus K Q E divided by M times R cubed times Z is equal to the acceleration. <clears throat> now again, harmonic oscillation, ignore the negative sign, ignore the Z. So whatever shows up between the negative and the Z is the angular frequency squared by definition, which means then that my angular frequency is equal to the square root K Q E over M R cubed angular frequency. <clears throat> so the electron will undergo simple harmonic oscillation. Okay. So again, electric field is more fundamental. If I know what the electric field is, I know what the force is. I have to have an electric field before I can have a force. So if I know what the electric field is at a particular place in space, if I put my charge particle there, then I also know the force on it. We can then find the acceleration from that force by simply using Newton's second law. So in this chapter, we have two more things to talk about. We're going to talk about what does electric fields tell us about conductors. And then finally, we're going to talk about what's known as an electric dipole. We're going to put that thing into an external electric field and see what happens to it. And so those are the last two things. So we'll do that tomorrow. After that, we'll do some group assignments, which means we'll start chapter 24 on Friday. So one thing I will warn you about with chapter 24, it is very conceptually difficult. 
It's called Gauss's law. It's fantastic. But even though it's very conceptually difficult, once you understand how to use it, it's ridiculously easy. But you have to put in some effort to understand it. Then we're going to ignore that for a while, and we're going to come back to basically exactly the same thing again when we get back to magnetism. So something very similar to it. Right? So and I'm going to warn you now, by the time we get to Friday, we're going to be talking about something that's very conceptually difficult. So make sure you have your thinking caps on on Friday. So don't party too much and drink too much in the morning. So let me do it after. So have a good day. I'll see everybody tomorrow. <laughs>